Hi, everybody. This week's readings focus on one poet in particular, Langston Hughes. In this video, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on Langston Hughes, as well as the time period that he was living in. As I see in this slide, Langston Hughes was one of the central poets of the Harlem Renaissance, which was a cultural, social, and creative movement that took place in New York in the 1920s and 1930s. As we read Hughes' work this week, I'd like us to consider it in relation to this cultural context. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Harlem Renaissance. After World War I, many African Americans moved to northern cities, including New York City. Many of these people had served in the military during the war and had experienced more liberal racial attitudes in Europe. When they returned to the U.S., they began demanding better economic opportunities and respect for their culture. Harlem, which is an African-American neighborhood in uptown Manhattan, became an intellectual and creative center. Many of these writers, artists, and musicians were interested in African-American history and black culture. And this attitude uh, is in some ways best encapsulated um, by a 1925 essay um, by Arthur A. Schomburg. And in this essay, he claimed that, quote, the Negro has been a man without a history because he has been considered a man without a worthy culture. So all of the writers, artists, and musicians of the Harlem Renaissance in some way wanted to reclaim this history and produce creative works that were grounded in their culture. And this brings us to Langston Hughes. Hughes, as I said earlier, was one of the most important voices of the Harlem Renaissance. His poetry reflects many of the themes of the Harlem Renaissance, including an exploration of African American history and identity, as well as some experiments with poetic forms. At the time that Hughes was writing, poets outside of the Harlem Renaissance were writing works that required uh, readers to have specific cultural knowledge. These works were often very difficult to decipher, and you have to have a high level of education and uh, knowledge of a lot of arcane mythology uh, and other kinds of academic information in order to make sense of these works. Hughes's poetry was different from a lot of these works in that it incorporated the everyday speech and jazz rhythms of Harlem. So now I'm going to talk about a few of the poems that are assigned for this week. I won't talk about all of them, uh, but there's a few of them that uh, will be easier to read and to make sense of if you have some background information on them. Uh, the first poem I'm going to talk a little bit about is the poem Theme for English B. As I say here, theme is an old word for essay. So you can think of this poem as essay for English B. Uh, as you'll Notice when you read the poem, it begins with the speaker explaining an essay that he's required to write for an English class, and then the rest of the poem presents his thoughts about that essay. As I say here also, it can be tempting to think of Hughes as the speaker of the poem, uh, because he provides so many details about himself and his life. However, it's important to note that the speaker's biographical details do not match Hughes's biographical details. The speaker says he was born in Winston-Salem, South Carolina, and went to college in Durham. Uh, Hughes, uh, unlike the speaker, was born in Joplin, Missouri, and he went to college in New York. So although this poem is probably influenced by Hughes's experiences, the poem is not necessarily biographical. So it's important to keep that in mind when you're reading the poem. And then the other poem I'm just going to briefly talk about uh, is The Negro Speaks of Rivers. Um, as indicated by this title, the speaker, of the, the speaker of this poem is this figure who calls himself, quote, unquote, the Negro. Uh, and once again, it's important to remember that this is not necessarily Langston Hughes. And as you're paying attention to the poem, and I want you to pay attention to how the speaker, the Negro's persona is developed over the course of the poem and what he comes to symbolize. So rather than being a sort of specific concrete person, uh, the speaker uh, sort of comes to symbolize a lot of different things. So I want you to think about what it is that he sort of symbolizes and encompasses uh, based on how he presents himself within the poem. 
And then finally, uh, before I close, I just want to provide a brief note on language and about uh, sort of the terms that we use for talking about uh, race and people of different races. Uh, during the time that Hughes was writing, as I say here, uh, the word Negro was the preferred term for African Americans. Uh, it was, in some ways, the most sort of progressive term of that period. Uh, since then, however, uh, that word has been replaced with the terms black and African American. So uh, unless you are quoting directly from a work, uh, I ask that you use the terms black or African American when you're talking about um, black people when you're writing for this class. Um, you're free to use uh, the term Negro or other terms that are used in the poems if you're directly quoting from that poem. So for example, the title of The Negro Speaks of Rivers um, has that word in it, so you're welcome to use it then. However, if you're not directly quoting, uh, I ask that you use the terms black or African American. So with that said, um, I'm looking forward to seeing what you think of the poetry for this week.